uh, very influential dudes in shaping our city um, do not have the acclaimed careers that they do and the time spent in practice without being uh, having strong opinions strong ideas and being slightly opinionated it goes with the territory so I've already heard that the question I'm asking is the wrong one. Uh, many are not regionalists or uh, West Coast modernists. Look at all the people that have come to see you anyway. Uh, and one of the things they want to talk about is um, the uh, dictatorship of City Hall. That was one of the <laughs> ideas that came up. Well, you know, all of us have, many of us in this room have dealt with City Hall and the dictatorship, and that's not, that's a pretty technical subject, and it's not one we're going to talk about tonight. I'm going to take the space to say that. Um, however, all of you have done great work, have influenced the city and the area here that we live in, and have had, spent a lot of time um, in practice, um, in design, and I think people are probably really interested in what has influenced you and what has been important to you in your practices. Um, are people interested in that? Yeah. So I think that's what I'd like to, to start with tonight. And one of the questions I have, and you don't have to answer it, you can just talk about influences, but one of the questions I had is, in the time that you practice, what has been the biggest change? What has been the largest and most influential change in your bodies of work? John? Okay, um, I, I think it's the people. This, uh, when I came to Vancouver in the 60s, urban design was a non-existent thing. And we all accepted that. And because of our climate, because of our social attitudes and everything else, we actually have changed this city dramatically, more than any other city in Canada. And in a funny way, we're thought of as unique, except when I came, the three plazas that were here was one, the Queen E, which was a lot like Plaza de la Marie, just a raised above the street and a piece of sculpture in it, and that was good enough. And we've changed that, being spaces for people to use, to uh, entertain, to do all sorts of things. But that's partly because we are on the West Coast and that West Coast attitude is a very social, all time of the year, don't worry, <laughs> don't, don't carry an umbrella. <laughs> so th I think that change is the most dramatic change to where we are and what we've done. Interesting. And so the city, do you, do you see people more interested in living in the outdoors than when you originally arrived? I mean, Not only the outdoors, I see them living in the city and yeah. animating the city. No, it's the place is all. <laughs> yeah. Hey, there wasn't an outdoor restaurant when I came in here. You had, couldn't have drink at a, a, a glass of wine at a restaurant either. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you went to the pub <laughs> and then there was the men's door and the, and the women's store. store. That's yeah. how backward we were yeah. when I arrived. So not only uh, are they, uh, and our parks, I mean, there were no waterfront parks. There was no place to, to um, walk and things other than the streets. And so we've changed this uh, because of the people and because of the climate. By the way, we did the first outdoor restaurant in Vancouver. Around the corner it was Gunther's and uh, Maple Tree Square. Huh. Had a hell of a time getting it approved. <laughs> Richard, Putting we're not going to talk about sidewalks. City Hall, remember? <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Paul? Um, I, uh, sorry, a little, little too much of a good thing. Um, I, 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 I think there are two uh, dimensions that, for me, are, 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 are uh, uh, are fundamental that result in a world a little different than than what we all came into in our youth. Um, the first one has to do with uh, uh, I'm going to take it, take them in reverse order. Take the, the the first one is the second, which is is um, the this fellow McLuhan who uh, early in our uh, 
evolving years uh, pronounce something like the medium is the message and I certainly didn't, I don't think I had a clue what he was talking about, what he meant by that. But with the advent of the electronic digital world that we now inhabit, I think he's right, uh, along with God knows how much else that the whole phenomena of computer has, has affected the, the, the kind of life we, we, we're afforded and the, and the way we have to behave. Um, the, 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 in, in, as it applies to architecture, the way we uh, imagine, conceive of, see, and then translate that into some, some kind of realization uh, that used to be by something very crude technically and, you know, a, a pen or a pencil uh, and the like. And, and a brain. And a, and a brain. <laughs> and, and there was a, a sensibility and a tactility that inevitably worked into that. With the advent of, of a computer to do this describing for us, it takes on different qualities and I can't help but think that our ability to do that and our perhaps necessity has changed the kinds of things we do and, and what they're like. On, on the one hand, you cannot render the qualities, for instance, of a sheet of glass and how it reflects or how it behaves or, or compositions of metal and all, and all the qualities of finish. You can't, you can't communicate those uh, by hand the way a computer can. And, and yet, uh, it, it's very difficult to maintain that a semblance of that thing we call soul. In, in, a, in a digital or electronic mm -hmm. device. The, the, the other point I thought uh, was about change. Um, I was intrigued when you brought up the idea of, of the uh, dictatorship at City Hall. Uh, <laughs> I think that was a, a remark I made and I didn't limit it to City Hall. Um, it was actually a quote I got from Chuck Brook who said we're living in a bureaucratic dictatorship and we won't go into that, but what I do think is that the difference between the world we, we, we came into and the world we operate in today is that we have a very different way of accommodating a social exchange or culture exchange. Everybody has an opportunity to say anything they like about anything. One of the current problems is that we, we keep hearing about is that through these um, media it's possible to make remarks and share them with thousands or hundreds of thousands without signing your name to it. And that's not a good thing. But what is a good thing that anybody can say whatever they like about whatever. And, and, and as a society, I, I, I guess in an old world, in a simple village, in a simple construct, uh, that happened around the well or the, or, or, or the marketplace. But uh, in, in our world, it, it happens another way. And Lord knows, you know, some of the things Don was touching on about the, the quality of the uh, experience that we were afforded in our youth and, and what we now have. This, this city we had the great good fortune to come into is, is a magic place be, be, because of all that's been possible in, in, in the course of our living our lives. Probably not. Mm -hmm. what, what about you, Bruno? What about me? <laughs> Well, we touched on the dictatorship, couldn't help it, uh, <laughs> earlier. All of us have lived through it. And a friend of mine came up with a beautiful phrase, um, this is brain surgery by citizen surgeons. We can't wait for the day where you're due for brain surgery and a citizen comes in and said, I'm going to do it. <laughs> it's a metaphor, I think. <laughs> for, for the um, degradation, I'll put it that way, of uh, the participatory movement, which is was such a breath of fresh air. And believe me, I've been an advocate of that forever. Um, in fact, Andrew and I fought over this many years ago. <laughs> the, the point is, it isn't participation. It's platitudes. So let, let me just, I'll just be a little outrageous and say, be, it's, yes. it's probably gone wrong. And we would call it bureaucracy. We can call it ignorance. 
We can blame another society, growth, bad bureaucrats, sloppy execution of visions, etc. But I think it's bigger than that, and it comes back to something that you just touched on, Paul. And um, it's that anybody can say anything, anytime, and that's fact. And I don't think it is. I used to. I used to. I admit to that. But I think it's gotten way beyond that. So to bring it back to, uh, to architecture and uh, urban design, as, as Don mentioned, um, we had a Hippocratic Oath. You know, if you teach long enough, you've got to get religious about it. And the Hippocratic Oath was first create beauty. Forget everything else. If you can understand that, and I know beauty is in the eye of the beholder and all that, all the relativism that implies, but I think that's the ethical position. So that's, and, and I see that happening. I, I do. I'm not a critic of what's going on. I think it's happening. Um, the other thing that's getting at me, I guess, uh, when, you, when you get old enough and you've seen enough, you're going to see all the bad things. But, you know, among, among the good things that's going on is that people are willing to experiment. And, and uh, I'm, of course, all for that. Probably everybody in the room is for that. But experiments are about failure, you know, and we must fail often. But the problem in Vancouver is we don't fail in epic proportions. The word is epic. <laughs> So, so I'm looking for epic failures here to really bring us around to what we're all about. And you don't think the failures are epic? No, I don't. They're the uh, the better metaphor is the frog in the water. You know, you, you put the frog in the water, you heat up the pan, you heat up the pan, and it'll I boil like Crown death. Life. That's an epic <laughs> success. It's still well, the best commercial here. tower downtown. <clears throat> Interesting. So, the failures have to be worse. Yeah, I don't think failures are bad. By the way, we're all about failure. Okay. You know, I mean, okay. this is the way we do great things. Well, and we get to renovate. Exactly. <laughs> Which isn't a bad thing. No, it's a good Incremental. thing. Incremental. It's a good thing. Small it's, act. it's the scientific method. It's what rationalism is all about. We're, we're living through it. I'm just. That's suggesting very yeah. that Vancouver really, it, to be really honest, is a pretty good success story yeah. of what's going on. So it's not as though I'm condemning what's here. What I'm saying to you is, it's not enough. As a yeah. former faculty friend of mine used to say, everything is not enough. So I'm looking for the epic side mm -hmm. of that conversation. What about you, Peter? Yeah. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. I, I agree with, uh, with Don that it's, uh, Vancouver is a pretty city. But um, I think, personally, you're talking about how it was in the old days and now. And how it's changed. How it's changed. And how you've changed. I think, I think that it's... The city, uh, both Vancouver and the concept of the city, has has um, reduced in significance. I don't think Vancouver is the vital city it used to be, and that's simply, it's got nothing to do with architecture, it's that the businesses have all left, the big businesses. Used to be Mac Blow, for instance, was um, the, one of the major forestry companies in, in North America, in the world. Uh, Canadian Airlines was based here. Uh, West Coast Transmission were based here. There were a lot of major corporations that were based here. A lot of them to do with um, resource extraction and fishing and those sort of things. All of those have gone. Now if you're doing a, a project, a significant project, you, you're being vetted by some junior vice president who then has to send it to Toronto or New York for, for review. So. I think in that sense, the city is less significant than it was, but it is pretty. And I think... So the visionary clients aren't there, you mean? No. 
not in the same way that they okay. used to be. Okay. I'll give you an example. Um, you know the West Coast Transmission Building? Anybody know what that is? Mm -hmm. Well, Condos, no. Th that's okay. That's, that's, <laughs> that's evolution. But um, I worked for the firm that did it, which was Rohn and Adel, and I had nothing to do with the design, but I helped Bill Rohn take the, take the model in to show Frank McMahon, and that was the guy who owned the business. And Frank said, uh, we put the model down, and Frank said to Bill, I like it, Bill, build it. Now today, that would have to go, that would be, we'd have to go to Toronto or New York, there'd be three months of surveys and the studies and things like that, and then they'd say, well, it's fine, but don't hang it off the center of the building. Um, so, but also I think the concept of the city is, is, I would say, dead. I think the city is dead, and I don't mean Vancouver, I mean the whole idea of city. It's, it's an old concept. We had to come here because people needed to work. Today in the digital world, you don't have to be here. And I think the, um, the smaller, I was going to say suburbs, but the further afield than the suburbs, the other places like Kamloops and places like that are going to thrive. Um, the, the, nobody can live, afford to live here anywhere. The city will, will exist but it won't be the city that we think of as the concept of a city. It's, um, there's a saying when we, in, in, it's not a saying, it's a, what do you call it? Anyway, when, when the king dies in England, they say God, sa uh, um, what do they say? King uh, is dead, God <laughs> the the king. king is dead, God save the king. And I think the city is dead, God save the city. And I think wow. we, have, we haven't found yet what the city should be. We're still doing, trying to get people, trying to convince people that the city isn't going to change. There's not going to be uh, affordable housing. All those things are gone. So how do you do that? And a lot of people are, are moving out. You don't yet see it, but just look at today's sun. Where did you see restaurant reviews? Today they were in Ladna, you know. Um, they used to always be in Gastown or somewhere like that. So the city is changing and I think it's something that we have to recognize and we have to respond to. And I don't know if we are responding to it yet, but it's something we have to. But just as, just as a lot of the um, major influencers and, and businesses and industries have left, and you have to check things across the country in terms of approvals, um, now there are a lot of conglomerate firms that talk about having to run things by the partners, in architectural yeah, yeah. firms, design firms, that have to run things by the partners in Edmonton, Calgary, Toronto, Montreal. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's sure. the way of the world. It's the practices. Oh. There are a lot of heavy-duty practices in this city now that run that way too. It's, it's kind of the way things are going. Well, this takes back to what Paul was saying, that the computer yeah. is influences. And allows and it to happen. Well, it's more the computer I see. In fact, <clears throat> um, my experience was uh, sitting with Frank Messon in the office, and he was on the phone with Eb Zeidler. And he drew mm -hmm. a little sketch, and he handed it to one of the staff and send, said, send this to Eb. And <clears throat> before we he had two more sentences out, the gal was bringing it back from the oh. office and said, Here's what Ed has. And he said, see that? And I thought, whoa. In sitting in a meeting, we were communicating and drawings yeah. there. So I was, as that was the time I was giving my company over to Jane. And, uh, I, but I went saw Jane a few days later and I said, don't worry about computers. Get a fax machine. Her answer was, what's a fax machine? <laughs> That's how, that, how much we have changed from the fact that it was, I thought, our best communicating thing we've ever had. And within a couple of years, we had commuters. And what Paul was saying, and what you, you were saying just now, both of you, about, yes, we have partners all over the world. We have um, probably more of our developers in China than we do in Canada. But that's because of the computer, because we can communicate instantly. And it isn't that it has to go through three partners. Simultaneously, three partners look at it and make a decision. So I... <laughs> I don't share Peter's pessimism. 
I think this I'm still, not pessimistic. That sounded pretty <laughs> pessimistic. <laughs> it's there. I'm realistic. Say, by the way, I'm realistic. <laughs> a realist. Yeah. I'm not the realist you are. <laughs> that I think that Vancouver has got to be one of the greatest cities for people to live in. It is expensive, but that's because everybody wants to live here. I mean, that's just the problem. So, uh, scarcity <coughs> creates that. And I think we've got uh, a city that's designed for people to live in and and not for corporations. It's the walks we can do around the our edges, the parks, the housing. Uh, people are living in the city, and they didn't used to. They lived in Shaughnessy or somewhere else. So parties. See, it'd be, I, mean, I really think it's a great city still. <laughs> So Richard, quietly on the far end, it's not like you. What have you got to say? Well, um, how, how has our practice changed over the years that I've been here? Well, it, it, it's evolved and grown like the city itself has evolved and grown. I was 28 years old when I decided to set up shop and we did renovations of houses and we got lucky and got some new buildings, some cabins on the Gulf Islands, and an optical shop, and and um, and uh, our practice has grown over the years. We we did institutional projects and various kinds of projects. The city has also grown and and matured, and and our practice has grown and matured. And when you stay in practice long enough, as we have, with my son now managing the practice, we have a practices of those large mixed-use projects. Um, and um, these are the kinds of projects that are being done in the city that were not being done when I started uh, 50 years ago next June. So it's an evolution that has taken place uh, both in our practice and in the, in, uh, in the city itself. In terms of the technology that now comes to bear on it, it, it's marvelous what one can do with computers. They have their drawbacks, however, in terms of um, uh, the misinterpretation of the level of completion of a project. It used to be you drew a, a concept drawing and it was sketchy and no, there were no illusions that the project was finished or that you could build it from those drawings. When you do now a computer drawing of a, of a concept, uh, the owner looks at it and says, oh, you know, it's, we can just job out, build it. And, and there's a tendency in many offices, and I think ours is uh, also guilty of this, of thinking the drawings are a lot, the design is a lot more complete than it is because the drawings are so beautiful and crisp and so on. And, um, and you, you don't go to, you, you don't see the, the transition in media that, that communicates to you the level of completion, how much work you need to do. So that is one of the downsides of uh, the comp computer uh, uh, technology. But there are magnificent uh, <laughs> examples of uh, how one can, uh, I mean, 3D modeling, for instance, or even virtual reality. Um, walking through a building used to be, um, you know, I'd get a set of drawings and mark them up and and hand them to the project manager, whoever was working on it. Now I can put on the 3D goggles and walk through the building, and, and the project manager, you know, stands stands around with a notepad as I speak about what has to be changed because there's no drawing. We're, we're now communicating and and 3D, and, and uh, I'm seeing the space that we have. It's incredible, and uh, I think um, that um, it's, it's way, it, it, it allows you to do way more than we could have uh, in the past. But truthfully, I've seen drawings by all of you. Truthfully, did you not all love to draw? Yeah, sure. I mean, was it not fun? I mean, Paul. Well, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. yeah but, absolutely. Yeah. It's been fun. Yeah, well. and, yeah and, there, and, there, and there was a feedback between the paper and your eyes and your brain. You, uh, when you drew something, it suggested something else, and you could, uh, you know, react to it. But now you can do that though by by uh, using uh, 3D modeling, where uh, in my case I get someone to do the 
SketchUp modeling, and then I can look at it and react to it and, and get it changed instantly. And so uh, it's, it's just amazing. I think maybe what, what one of the points is that uh, out of out of your question uh, is that uh, in terms of what McLuhan was apparently trying to allude to, mm -hmm. that not just the way we do things, but what we do is different today because of how we can do it and and or how we do do it. Yeah. And and. It will take a lot more time than we have tonight to discuss <laughs> whether that's better or worse thing, but it is different because of how we do it, of, of the medium that is our expression and our way of communicating. I think, I think that's yeah. a good point, I think, and, and I, I agree. Um, I think we're just using, digitally, we just use these things as tools, but they haven't had the impact that I think they're going to have on on architecture, um, just like those tools. Um, I, I think that um, the whole way we, we live today, we, we rely so much on the computer, or say, I shouldn't say we, but generally people rely on the computer, and yet we're still designing buildings and Buildings look the same as they did when they were drawn by pencil and paper, as they do when they were drawn by computer, and the and yet the life that 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 has changed. I, I got to sort of think this out, but um, is totally different. Uh, people don't. I mean, you don't. Uh, how do you get to a place now? You don't go to the church on the corner and then turn right and then go to the oak tree and then go there or so. You get Siri to tell you how to get there. <laughs> but it's a fact, you know. So really, buildings are not as important as they used to be. That's one way to look at it. Your, your um, environment that you create is a lot of it is digital. So why are we doing the things we do inside buildings when you can do it digitally? You know, um, kids, kids uh, the schools still take kids to... Um, Rome. They should be taking them to Disneyland. And there you can see how digital um, environments are created and not to old places. I mean, it's interesting historically, but it's got nothing to do with the way we live today or the way we build today or anything like that. So I think the, the, the computer is something that we haven't even started to touch yet. And in the way that it's going to change our life and when it does change our life I think then um, our architecture will have to change and it could be that architecture becomes obsolete if you create digital environments why do you need brick and mortar environments other than to say dry and you know um, so I, I, I think that uh, but where's beauty in that where does as someone who's designed some pretty beautiful buildings where you know, as yeah, Bruno not, spoke of, where, you know, yeah, where does I, beauty stand in that paradigm? I think you could create, uh, digitally, you could create very beautiful buildings. You yeah, the could, computer is unlimited. No, that, that won't be the problem. I mean, no. we will advance to a point where those things are overcome. What well, we will well, there's do just a little, one little thing, and that has to do with materiality. You know, I mean, I'm well, sorry. That's, I'm people, sorry. You can you people can argued that about crafts. You know, when the industrial revolution started, that you lose the idea of craft. It's the same way that man has lost, in in a large sense, the sense of smell because he didn't have to find his way around through smelling uh, as much as he used to. So we've lost the, the sense of smell. We've lost the sense of craft. There's there are niche craftsmen, but I mean now it's the guy that. Um, I, in fact, I can tell you a story, Niels probably forgets this, but a friend of mine wanted to become a cabinet maker, and I said, talk to Niels, and he asked Niels, this is 20 years ago, Niels, so you won't remember, and, and I, the, he said, where, where should I, what should I learn? And he said, learn computers, and I think it was right, you know, these days, it's, it's, it, that's how, how things are made, um, but I still think that's just 
how they're made. It's not what they are making. That's right. And I think that you could create a, a box like this and you could do things digitally that would make this a totally different place. Why, why spend all that effort to make this great interior that is going to become obsolete in well, five minutes? Because the people who make those things get a tremendous amount of satisfaction from doing well, so. Well, so I like, but I mean, that's a, in, in, you know, it's well, lovely. Lo I like lot, if somebody a spends a, a couple of million dollars to make a, me a satisfied. Lot, no, you know? a, a lot of people <laughs> like to make things. They like to make food, they like to make cakes, they, they like to oh, make yeah, a, a, lot, a lot of no, things. No, no, I agree. The I act agree. of I'm making is a very important part of, of human life. I agree, I agree. But well, though you, those things can still happen in, a, in a, a shed. You can make cakes, you can do all those things. You don't have to spend $10 million to make a kitchen. Yeah. Yeah. One, one thing Paul said uh, the next. was the fact that the sketch, which we used to do, and there was a little sketch and all that, is now the computer. And the client looks at it and sees it as a finished product because it does have that finished look. And in that, I think we are in danger. Not it's not going to happen, but the danger is that the five of us sitting here, uh, when th those people who are going to follow us at that point, being in that position, won't be doing the same kind of thinking, the time it takes. To, I mean, I, I, <laughs> when I design these days, it takes me twice as long. <laughs> uh, but I rework it and rework it, and it's not right. Those things are going to get missed. The computer is going to do it and set off, and there it is. And that personality that, well, my book, I'm Frank Lloyd Wright, a good example is that, uh, not the detail and the fussiness of it, but just the idea of creating space. I was in the Navy, and I, that's when I got a hold of his books and decided, I want to be an architect, and this looks great. That isn't going to happen. The buildings are going to be computerized, or the danger is. Because of budget, because of schedule, because of all these things, the developer is going to say, "Go with it." Somebody who wants to spend that time that why is that a danger? Because it won't have that refinement. It'll end up <laughs> being much. It'll have a, a very different refinement. Yeah, well, it would. Yeah. Uh, that's the danger. <laughs> the, the guy that carved the, the capitals on the columns is no longer there. Nobody can do that refinement, but that doesn't matter. Um, We're all I, 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 We're I, no, I think time, time, time in thinking about a project is important. Now Bruno has something he wanted to say. Yeah, I, <clears throat> you you touched on something earlier, but I think it it relates. Um, the uh, we're, we're we're up here, and we're starting to talk about what's wrong with our profession. And we've been through this many times. And so we're, we're the last people uh, to who could see what our profession is all about. We're blinded by what we do, and we love what we do. The issue here is about the aesthetic environment. That's a highly personal thing in a world that isn't very comfortable to the person. But Richard talked about it. You know, we like to do things that we like. Architects like to build buildings. Form is involved. It's an aesthetic principle. Aesthetics are part of ethics. Ethics are personal. Now, we all deal with that in our daily life. But one thing that's happened to this, the design professions generally, under, under the uh, compelling corporatization that's gone on in the world, is that we've become corporatized. A corporation is not a person. The ethics are not personal. They are corporate ethics. Their objective is a corporate set of objectives. Now, I'm not going to try to paint all corporations as evil. That's not the point. The point is we've displaced ethics and aesthetics. So I go back 
to my Hippocratic oath, first create beauty, because that's a challenge. And it makes us think about or deal with the immediacy, compelling, five-fingered grasp of reality, to quote another great architect, um, in, in our lives and in the buildings we do and in the environments we live in. Now, if one were to speculate and say, oh my goodness, we're all wonderful at this. It's all, so we're going to get beautiful cities out of that? No. Because the mayors and the corporate chieftains also have to wake up and be accountable for their ethics and aesthetics. Now, we can get sentimental about Macmillan Bloedel or whatever. I don't want to do that. We have relied on individual people to do that. Architecture tends to be maybe one of the last places where, in fact, the opportunity for personal, ethical, aesthetic work is possible. It's challenging, but it's possible. So my point is corporatization has been a financial success story, but problematic because it has displaced ethics in design. And that's one of the problems that we're facing. I don't think we can deal in the world without corporations, like we can't deal without City Hall and that bureaucracy. But what we have to find is a way to reintroduce that aesthetic dimension to the work. That's what uh, I feel. <laughs> I, 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 um, yeah. I think, uh, Bruno, you might get an argument with some people who, who question whether in this day and age ethics and aesthetics are linked to the same extent that were in the past. I think a case could be made that ethics and social justice are linked much more strongly than aesthetics. Boy, that's shut everybody up. <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> you may have summed it up. Thank you, Thank you. <laughs> Do you want to say something, Paul? Uh, I'm struggling. <laughs> um, we, we get into the dilemma of trying to deal with words that are a real mouthful, like. Uh, aesthetics and ethics and the like. Um, Good. Uh, there, there's, there's a point at which I wonder if we can come back to, um, you know, our root purpose and our root nature. This this thing we call architecture uh, can can be seen as a many splendored thing, but essentially, if we take it as the making of of of, of the things we devise to to um, accommodate our life. Um, Bud used to quote Shakespeare as saying that all the world's a stage, be thou a joyous actor. We're all, this stuff we do, this architectural contrivance is really just the stage that we inhabit. And it has at, at a root level uh, uh, some very simple root purposes. It's, it's shelter. And, and uh, if we were comfortable 24 hours a day all year round in the environment that we find ourselves in, like most animal life is, somehow or other, uh, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't generate, we wouldn't think we needed building. But, but we do, so we generate something to modify the heat if it's too hot to keep cool in or to uh, make ourselves find, find warmth if, if it's too chilly outside. And in, in our, the climate we know better here, uh, uh, it rains sometime and we don't like getting wet, so we put something up to keep us dry. Now, uh, uh, there's a thing no more than an enough. umbrella that, that can do that for you very well and extremely simply and, and often very beautifully. But we want something a little more than that. Uh, so if we're, if we're keeping dry and we're keeping cool enough or warm enough and comfortable enough, 
somehow after that, there's a quality that I think um, we, we needs to leave those who inhabit these things we contrive, whether it's a, a street or a building or, or a place of a specific consequence, that it, sh it should be a place that people on, on average are made to feel better in. They feel okay in, they may feel worthwhile in, they may even feel ennobled if it's really doing something that's worthwhile. The word. That's uh, the word. And, and it's about uh, uh, on the ignobling this thing we call our human spirit. All these are words that we can't define. It's like trying to define love. You, you get into a lot of trouble very quickly if you try to. Um, but it's, it's about um, uh, working with a compassion that concerns itself with the experience that all of those we, we're, we're left to inhabit these things uh, 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 feel better for. And, and part of what's at the root of what I find I, I, think we, I think we all struggle with today is that uh, with all of the ability for so many of us to have so much to say about so much, uh, we bring in factors, perhaps criteria or requirements that may be nice and they may be sensible but they aren't necessarily fundamental. And uh, the problem with the way our societies come to work at this point and our aggravation with that B word is, is, is that we, we get not only told to concern ourselves with how we expend energy in our, in our climate. We've, been, we've developed habits of being very wasteful in our ways of doing that and we should get better at it good thinking, good idea, good for human race, good for the planet. But then they go on, they, whoever they are who make the rules, tell us how to do that. <laughs> and, I, and that's where I think we get past center. Uh, and so we all become automatons who have to tug our four walks in order to get permission to do something or other. And when it's all said and done, we spend so much time trying to understand the criteria. Uh, and see that we're meeting it, that we run out of time to and lose sight of concerning ourselves with the very point Richard, I think, made that, that, uh, that, that, that qualitative uh, factor, that, that, uh, that thing we used to think was what it's all about. And, and uh, the, the preoccupation with uh, too much particular is at the expense mm -hmm. of cherishing and celebrating the spirit. There was a great book written, I don't know how long ago, called Brunelleschi's Dome. I don't yeah. know if many of yeah. you have read it. Yeah. But um, it was about the, the building of Brunelleschi's Dome. And he had exactly the same problems that we're talking about today. He had problems with City Hall. He had problems <laughs> with raising money. He had problems with engineers. Things haven't changed. It's no worse today than it used to be. We're, we're one of those, if we consider ourselves artists, we're one of the few artists that actually has to handle these interactions all right. the time. The success of an architect has a lot to do with how well he handles the city hall, how well he handles finance, how well he handles his consultants, how well he handles his builders. That's, that's a major, in fact, I always wonder, because when you go to school, everybody's taught to design buildings, which I think is wrong. I think te teachers, people should be taught how to make buildings. Um, and I say that because when you graduate from any university, I think uh, maybe one in the class is actually going to design a building of anything significant. If one, if, you know, if not, the, but the people who... Um, are going to look after those buildings and, and, and do most of the work, are kind of looked on as not quite the, the top of the, of the, of the heap, and, they, and yet they're the more important people. So I, I think this whole thing about City Hall and everything, yeah, City Hall's a mess, I agree. City Halls have always been in a mess. We've had ups and downs. I think, like, Ray Spexman was a great planner. Um, and then we've had useless planners since, since, um, since Larry yeah. Beasley left. That was the last one after that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, 
So, <laughs> I'm saying they're there. Okay. okay. <laughs> Ouch. So I, I, I don't know. I think you know, architects have always had the same issues. We've got to, we've got to go beyond that and see what is the architecture in the future going to be. And I'm not sure that we're facing up to the very different world that we're coming into. I, I think there's a difference between. Uh, uh, the problem with architects is they think they're artists, and, yeah. and, and they're not—they're not artists, and they don't have control of their medium the way most artists are understood to control their medium. I think the quality that an architect needs is creativity, which is different from being artistic, and uh, and I think thinking of it that way makes a difference. And I think on that note, our time is up. I want to thank the crowd, the great turnout. It's been really exciting looking out at everybody. Well, just I want to thank people and then they can ask questions. You want to answer no, questions, no. Cardone? Okay. Um, I want to thank the crowd. I want to thank Inform. And I want to thank the West Coast Modern League for bringing this to light for shining the big light on these influential projects that we live with and I think take for granted to a great extent. And uh, without getting into an argument about who's a West Coast modernist and who's a regionalist, I think there's a character to our environment that people like these five have built and contributed to enormously. And it's great that we're celebrating it. So, for those of you who don't want to drink yet, um, there are there are questions. We'll take questions, and these people will answer. Questions, yes. No, you were. Hi, I'm just w wondering if you think Airbnb could change the way the city, a city looks, just because people can't afford to live in Vancouver, in Paris, and it's happening in cities around the world that are popular with tourists. And I'm okay. wondering if that could have an impact on how cities are designed in the future. Definitely. Do you want to no, say no, any more no, than that? No, I, 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 <laughs> I, I, think, I think we I, need I, a little more, Peter. I think it definitely Airbnb will Airbnb change the world, just as Uber will change the world. The, these, the, that's part of that digital revolution that we're talking about. It, it's it's last, totally yes. changing the city. <laughs> I, I'd like to say a little, little bit, uh, sort of taking off from where you're talking about, and the whole issue of affordability. Um, it seems to me that um, that uh, one of the approaches one could take to affordability is to, is to try to get um, the community as a whole to subsidize um, housing units rather than the government. And, and the, the missing middle competition that the urbanarium did started to look at things like intergenerational living where the older generation who are the owners of all this equity would share their wealth with a group of people that they're, they're not necessarily their families of different ages and to create many little communities uh, like, like extended families were in the past uh, so that uh, these older people don't have to go to an old folks home, they can live in their community within their own home with younger people and kids and so on. And the subsidy that occurs for the students who do things maybe in exchange for rent or the people who can't afford, um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a self-contained subsidization kind of a situation that I think we need to explore more um, rather than trying to build more social housing and hope that that'll solve the problem. Questions? Are there questions? Yeah. Okay. It says, what are you most excited about the future possibilities in architecture? <laughs> it's a small question. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> Say that again. What are you most excited about in terms of future possibilities in architecture? What are we excited about? Yeah. Quite simply, architecture. <laughs> that is an answer. But, um, no, I, I think what... I'm not going to try to summarize, but I do believe what you've been hearing is people who have produced architecture talking about that that will continue. I'm not going to get into the issue of craft or the obsolescence. I do believe that, in fact, as was pointed out, you know, shelter is a pretty primary thing, just like clothes are a pretty primary thing. And shelter and all the desire and expression that comes with it will always be a need. The people producing buildings are not necessarily producing architecture. That's always been true. No, no surprise there. But I do believe that, and I, I would say it's highly personal, the personal code of creating beauty is a driving force. And we live in a time where there can be many, many, many definitions and expressions of beauty. It's not this beauty or that beauty. It's just beautiful. We know it when we see it. We know it when we experience it. And you're seeing five people here, maybe six, who in fact know it and are advocating it. So I'm, I remain optimistic, not pessimistic, as long as you can control that corporatization that's going on, which is another challenge, a different challenge. Any other? Well, my comment on, on that is it, a little bit off of what we're talking about. Is, is <clears throat> um, when we were working on Concord, and uh, Stanley went up to the city manager and said, "Why am I not getting a permit?" And he said, "It isn't because you haven't designed a fantastic project. You have, but I want you to go back and design a fantastic city." And that's what we haven't done. So we have a lot of beautiful buildings by some fantastic architects over time through the city and currently still today, but it isn't making the city any more of a, a design city. It's, it's the money controls the building, the buildings go where they want, and it isn't contributing to the whole. And so more important than, we'll always design, and Art Bruno is right, there'll always be architects and we'll design beautiful buildings and if they aren't here, they'll be somewhere else, but uh, we're, we've lost sight of designing cities. I think there was a saying when I first came here, and I think it's still true. Vancouver is a beautiful setting in search of a city. Yeah. True. It's still so, and it's quit searching. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> That's the difference. Yeah. <laughs> they don't care. Okay. Oh, well, it was... I, I, it was uh, I have a comment I'd like to make. I've been sitting here looking at the work of <laughs> these five masters, and one thing that occurred to me, because I'm a slightly outsider, I came later to Vancouver and seeing and the younger. work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but one thing that really struck me is looking at the body of your work is they're highly personal and they're highly rooted to the place here. They're not interchangeable to Montreal or Toronto. And what I would observe in today's architecture, a lot of it is very impersonal and very superficial and interchangeable. And if we really look at hard at the work that you, all of you do, you all have your personality, you all have your stamp on our environment and is committed to the West Coast. And I just want to say that, I'm grateful to see that. Okay. Thank you, five. Thank you for talking so personally about your influences. I think people found it very interesting. I sure did.